I mean, I said we'd go to the audience after three quarters of an hour, but that's not going to happen. Um, <laughs> the, um, the third part, let's, let's leap forward. So we've gone, we've gone back four billion years. We've done the 17th, 18th, into the 19th century. Let's get on to, because what I said at the beginning, you are a physician. You're a cancer doctor. You, you, you're in between meeting you yesterday and today, you've been in contact with labs in New York and in, and in India where you're actually treating patients. So let's talk about the third part of Virchow's idea that when cells go wrong, this is the ontogeny of, of disease. Cancer is a cellular disease. It is the unregulated growth of cells. Well, I mean, you know, Virchow himself saw, saw this. Uh, he was examining a patient and he found uh, leukemia, um, in fact, named it leukemia. Um, Cells have an incredible quality, which is that another quality of cells is that they um, start dividing and stop dividing. It is one of the qualities of life. Um, whenever I have graduate students, I ask them, the first question I ask my graduate students is, when you cut yourself, why don't you grow a new arm um, like a tree? Um, and the answer is we know some of the answer to that question, but not all the answer to the question. A wound heals and continues to heal, and when the cells meet each other, they pass signals to each other to stop dividing, and that's your wound that's healed. Um, cancer, in cancer, those signals are broken through genetic mutations, um, and that's the fundamental basis of cancer. We can talk about many, many other features of cancer, but the fundamental base of cancer is a cell where the normal regulation of cell division has been disrupted, and thereby you're get, you start getting a cell that can't stop dividing, and keeps dividing as a consequence of genetic mutations. Mm. And cancer as well is you know, an incredibly sophisticated and evolving thing as it's, as it's growing, a tumor that becomes, uh, the mutations accumulate as, as they grow and spread around the body and release cells with no purpose other than to keep growing. There's no foresight in cancer other than to, to make more cells to well, the detriment of the, of the organism. Well, so cancer in some ways goes back to your first question. Cancer is a distortion of the three principles of life. It's a distortion of genetics, it's a distortion of cell biology, and it's a distortion of evolution. Because the cancer cell is always evolving, and because as it evolves, um, it, becomes, it changes, mutations accumulate, it, it changes its own characteristics, it can co-opt uh, 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 properties from normal genes and, and make them uh, properties of cancer, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a fascinating thing that the disease that is now becoming the disease that sort of defines our century is, happens to be the disease that sits on top of disruptions of the three universal principles of life. Mm -hmm. And so fundamental to all aspects of, of biology. Not we are only just talking about humans here. Let, let, let's think about therapies, though. But we're, we're, you know, having established that cancer is a, a cellular disease, it is a misfunction of those, those principles, we can also utilize, we can mutate genes in cells, we can use cell therapies in order to cure loads of diseases, including cancers now. Right, so, um, I mean, the, the, some of the prominent cell therapies, and again, this is why I sometimes have to stay up nights in, in because India is 12 hours away, we've, we've started pioneering um, cell therapies in India. Um, and I think it's the proudest thing I've ever done. It's the proudest moment of my life because um, when I saw the first child that we saved um, with cell therapy, um, was a was a ten year old boy, um, so just uh, I'll just tell you the, the how it works and then talk a little bit about that moment. But um, the you can use a T cell. T cells are normal cells that go and kill other cells, and you can genetically reprogram it outside the body. I can take your T cells, draw it out, draw them out of your body, genetically reprogram them to kill your cancer, reinject them in your body. Um, and that, now it's called a CAR T cell, and I won't explain what CAR stands for. You can just um, imagine it as, as a modified, genetically modified, weaponized T cell. And we reinfuse those T cells in the body, and they go and kill the cancer. And they're actually vastly more effective than most chemotherapies. Um, these are for patients with relapsed refractory leukemias and lymphomas and myelomas, blood cancers, uh, mostly. Um, but as I said, it was. It, it is by far the proudest moment of my life when 
when this boy who was, had re relapsed refractory leukemia, 10 years old, um, came alive uh, with his, his CAR T cells. And is that, is that type of therapy, is that only for blood cancers, of which there are many? Yes. Um, so right now, for reasons we don't fully understand, um, these T cells don't seem to like going and killing solid tumors, which are also, which are, which are the majority of tumors, even though there are many blood cancers. Um, and we don't know exactly why. We have some clues why, but one of the scariest images I've ever seen in my life is a solid tumor um, with a ring of activated T cells all around it. But those T cells, for some reason, can't penetrate. The solid tumors m make substances that somehow prevent the uh, access to T cells. Um, I guess the bigger question, uh, just to carry on, uh, riff on this theme a little bit, um, is this idea of, of the new human. Um, and that's a very prov provocative idea in this title. Um, it's called The Exploration of Medicine and the New Human. And, and what I'm trying to convey in that is that the new human is not a sort of sci-fi, infrared-equipped um, character um, with prosthetics and, 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 and vision. You know what I say, uh, Keanu Reeves in a black mumu. Um, that's not the new human. The new human is a human that we're building prosthetically in some ways with cells, either their own cells that have been genetically engineered or cells that we borrowed from other bodies as in a bone marrow transplant. Um, there's an incredible example here of um, a, a psychiatrist, a, a woman in New York who's been pioneering, um, and other people have, have too, placing electrodes into the brain, very deep into the brain. These electrodes are thinner than human hair and finding an exact uh, spot where certain nerve cells are responsible, going back to Virchow, for devastating neurological diseases like Parkinson, but in her, in her case, depression. Um, and when she turns the current on, um, these neurons, these nerve cells, uh, respond and, and you get, some people get relief from really recalcitrant depression, things that no drug and no therapy works. Um, so these are examples of, of what I call new humans. These are people that are, are, that are walking am amongst us. Someone, with the, someone carrying a, a bone marrow from someone else's body is walking amongst us today. Someone carrying electrodes will start walking amongst us. And that's because we are build, having the capacity, the joint capacity of genetic engineering and cellular engineering has created the ability to create what I call the new human. Mm. That mix as well is fascinating. You talk in the book about how women, exclusively women, often, mostly, carry the cells of either uh, uh, unknown pregnancies or pregnancies that have resulted in, in births, and those cells of the child just float around their bodies, or they, sometimes they land and do things. And actually, you know, looking over the audience, many of you will be carrying the cells of someone who is not you, actually only the women. If you're a man and carrying those cells, you need to go to the doctor. <laughs> but isn't that, again, just a, you know, a, a crazy idea which, which is sort of post that 19th century bubble of, of, of discovery. But now... That's right. In fact, there are three papers today in Nature. I opened Nature this morning. There are three papers in Nature back to back that finally describe, and that's why it's not in the book because it was published yesterday, uh, <laughs> that finally describe how and why we can live with all these microbiota in our, in our guts. Because if T cells are there to recognize and B cells are there to recognize pathogens, then why aren't we constantly eliminating all the bugs that live inside us, which are really important for us, important for our digestion, our, uh, you know, so many functions now coming out. And outnumber human and outnumber cells, human beings like by, 10 by, to 1 or whatever Exactly. Is, yeah. and, and what was amazing about it is that until this morning, we didn't know. <laughs> so the second edition of the Song of the Cell will be out soon with that yeah. added to it. That's right, twice as thick. So. Twice as thick. And you can buy it again. Thick. Yes, exactly, exactly. Okay, I am going to open it up for, to, to questions now, so we can bring the lights up. Uh, so rules for questions, these are my rules. Um, so put your hand up. Questions are short sentences that end with an upwards inflection. <laughs> The second rule is, and this is based on published research, this is not me being politically correct, 
But if in question and answer ses sessions women ask questions first, then more women ask questions, but if men ask questions first, then women tend not to. So we'll take questions from women and men alternating your first. And the third rule is try not to be mad. Um, hi, Dr. Professor. Um, Mind-body connection. I mean, there's a lot of talk about uh, possibly cancer coming from childhood trauma and from uh, actual thoughts. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I'm not a believer in it at all. Um, I don't think that cancer comes from trauma. I think uh, people uh, who are traumatized have a hard time dealing with cancer in the sense that they often don't, they can um, ignore it, they can have problems with it. But um, I don't think that, the, that trauma can in any way directly affect our, 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 our genetics. Now, there's one caveat to that which is that, that um, there is a strong relationship between inflammation and cancer, very well established, um, and a strong relationship also between inflammation and stress, similarly well established. Um, the word stress is a meaningless word. Uh, it means something to you, it means something else to us. But when I'm talking about stress, and I'm talking about stress as inflammation, um, I do think that there's a relationship between inflammation and cancer. So if that's the lineage you're following, I think there's, a, there's something very productive there. Um, but uh, again, the word trauma is that means different things to different people. It has no meaning to geneticists, um, and so, um, so I don't think that that's the reason for, 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 for cancer. Okay, question from. Okay, I'm going to dot around the room. So let's go. Uh, you, 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 and you. There's four. Okay. So second one here. This gentleman in the third row. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, I, my question is around. I'm curious when you're researching this book. What was the evolution of, you know, when you talk about these, the idea of cell biology, you know, going back to this one cell, LUCA, um, how did this evolve in concert or was it perhaps stymied by religious thought at the time? You know, this is happening. Well, so. Do you, you repeat the question? Yeah, the, repeat, the question was how is, the, what, what is the intersection between this and between the evolution of cellular biology and religious thought? Um, well, vitalism is very important in, in religious thought, and spontaneous generation is also very important in religious thought. Um, and so um, both, so vitalism claims that you have this vital fluid that is special, um, and in fact that vital fluid comes to you from God. Um, at least one school of vitalists believe that, not all vitalists. Um, and, um, and spontaneous generation is similar um, in the sense that you are generated spontaneously and similarly cells are generated spontaneously. Um, the, the, the interesting thing about cell theory, unlike evolution, and to some extent unlike gen genetics, um, cell theory um, doesn't, didn't violate at least fundamental Christian principles, um, and therefore was allowed to evolve, I mean if you read the history, it was allowed to evolve quite independently once that vitalism and, and spontaneous generation were sort of set aside. And it was only much, much later than they, they began to intersect with, with, with religion again. I'll give you one example of that, and there are many. Um, it's much later when you have IVF, um, and you now have uh, genetic engineering of uh, potentially of human babies, that all of a sudden embryonic stem cells, much, much later, years, almost a century later, when, when, the, when, when religion all of a sudden wakes up and says, wait a second. Um, so it's very unlike evolution, or at least Darwin, Darwin's idea of evolution and neo-Darwinism, et cetera, et cetera, which did have a much more um, conflicting relationship with, uh, with religion. Yeah. Um, you know, I was, yes, I was thinking I could comment on that, but I won't. Um, well, why don't you comment? Well, on I, I mean, I, was, I think I'm not disagreeing with you at all. I think I think one of the th one of the relationships, one of the ways we characterise religion and its relationship with science is, I think, often is a sort of false dichotomy. But actually, religions are very um, tend to be specifically Judeo-Christian religions tend to be quite fluid in the way that they bounce in and out of scientific ideas. And there was much less resistance to Darwinian thinking than is often perceived in the 1850s and 60s. And it's only really 50 years later that, re that, that fundamentalists in America primarily become, regard evolution by natural selection as, as problematic. With, with cells, what Sid just said is absolutely correct. But what, what I was thinking is that 
the injection of the soul into the, into the fertilized egg occurs at multiple times, depending on which religion you're a member of and how that religion has changed over time. And so as, for example, um, Christians become more fundamental in America, the insolification, what's the word? Not insolification. In well, per let's, let's, go, let's go with insolification. Exactly. <laughs> uh, occurs at, at fertilization. And that's new. That's a, that's a new description that is really less than you know, 40 years old. Um, so religion is much more flexible than, than doctrinal. Um, so, so those relationships are always, always changing. That was, that was just what I was thinking as you were answering. Anyway, 